All right, let me pull this up. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Thanks to you guys for coming. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about this uh, topic, which I've been doing research since uh, now, unfortunately, five or six years. That seems a long time, but it really has gone really fast. So just to get to know my audience a little bit, I'm just going to ask raise of hands. I know some of my students are here, so you guys need to raise your hands. But um, uh, who are grad students in bio or something related? OK. What about something like chemistry? OK. Physics? OK. Um, engineering? All right. Um, what am I missing? What's that? People, what are people who didn't raise your hands, what, are, what is fields are you guys in? Oh, Baden, 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 Baden. Okay, the rest are Baden. Okay, cool, interesting. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. That's an interesting wide variety. So um, let me talk a little bit about what I do. So uh, let me just start with, a, with an overall introduction um, that may be useful. So I'm an economist by training, um, and I mostly the work that I do is in health economics. And the big summary of my work is just trying to understand how different policies are affecting individuals and individuals' decision-making. Um, and with the idea that like uh, trying to understand is this policy is working, yes or no, and if so, what's the cost, what are the benefits, are there better policies overall? So that's kind of like the overall framework for how I work. Um, and this is just one of the topics uh, that uh, I've been touching on for the past couple of years. So let me tell you a little bit of why this topic is interesting. So in uh, econ and also across different fields, there is a, a really a broad interest in understanding how does public health insurance can affect uh, health-related outcomes, i.e. if I give you health insurance, how does that change your health outcomes um, and your well-being? Um, and there's been a bunch of evidence on, on this and meaning that like people trying to study uh, this relationship um, and people understand health as like access to health, utilization of health, financial outcomes or, or healthcare measures. So different uh, set of outcomes. Um, you know, some uh, outcomes or, or results are consistent that we keep finding the same thing. Like if you get people health insurance, they'll have more access to the uh, doctors or it's easier for them to access that. Um, and some things that are a little bit less consistent, which is, for example, if you give people health insurance, does your ER visits, your emergency department visits, they increase or decrease? Some studies find they increase, some studies find they decrease, some studies don't find anything. And so like there's a little bit of a mixed evidence uh, on that. Um, and so most of what we know from these studies uh, is what happens when people are gaining public health insurance. So a lot of these studies are used in the framework of when the state expanded Medicaid, we look at, or when the Affordable Care Act, uh, Care Act we looked at, or when this policy was enacted that allowed my people to get health insurance like SCHIP or expansions in eligibility and so on. This is how we understand how people are gaining insurance and then reacting to their outcomes. Um, however, there's been very little evidence on what happens when people lose uh, public health insurance or lose health insurance in overall on any of these other outcomes. Um, and this is uh, economically relevant for the reasons that are, like, we're interested in economic theory, but also it is policy relevant. Uh, why? Because uh, there's been a lot of contemplation in the past years of what happens if we do a bunch of things that could a, contract the expansions that we've had with the Affordable Care Act. Um, but another way to see it is not just about like actual policies of contraction, but policies about um, uh, putting, for example, work requirements. So any, uh, any kind of these policies that are, what they're trying to do in some sense is, is cut back on eligibility or maybe do some of the contractions, at least that's their end result. Uh, this could be a, a, this type of study sort of things that could speak to that and like, okay, well, if we do any kind of policy where the kind of like the goal is to contract or to cut eligibility, how is that going to affect individuals? Um, is that going to affect individuals? Could individuals find a different, another way to uh, mitigate whatever uh, the lack of health insurance is? Uh, and so this is why it's interesting in front of policy making. Anecdotally, I started this uh, when I was in grad school, um, mainly because I saw somebody presented on on the effects of this reform on employment. I thought, oh, that's super interesting. Like, and I asked them, like, well, uh, have you done anything about health or are you going to do anything about the health outcomes of these individuals? And they're like, oh, no. And I was like, ha, okay, well, I'm going to do that then. Um, so I started grabbing the data and uh, started looking into that. And uh, then I realized how uh, important was the topic 
because everyone kept talking about in that time about the Affordable Care Act. It wasn't passed yet. So people were like, oh, yeah, you know, all this evidence about like, you know, what happens to people gain health insurance. And I was thinking this this is interesting. We have a lot of evidence in that. We don't have a lot of evidence on the other margin. Um, and so it'd be nice to uh, start pushing on that. Um, and so it was surprising to me that like uh, the, one of the first studies that I did uh, at that point was like the first kind of like causal study on people losing health insurance and health. That was like mind blowing that like I was able to, to claim that title. Uh, now there's a lot more papers that have come out and talked about that. Uh, one thing I wanna mention before I keep going, please ask all the questions that you want. I would love this to be an interaction rather than me lecturing you into sleep. So that will be fantastic, thank you. Okay, so, so from the policy perspective, uh, we, we, we wanna know a little bit of what would happen in these populations for different considerations. Um, and so that's not exactly what I focus on study. So the research questions that I'm gonna tackle in, in I'm gonna show you kind of like the results of a set of papers integrated into one presentation. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit weird, but uh, we'll tackle that. So what happens uh, to people's health or financial outcomes when they lose public health insurance eligibility? Um, what are the mechanisms of how losing health insurance is affecting your outcomes? This is actually a very important to uh, keep this question in your head because um, a lot of times people will say to you like, oh, you know, I'm studying how, for example, how health insurance affect uh, financial or healthcare access. You immediately wanna start thinking about stories of like how those mechanisms, how it could actually, that relationship be true. Because it's, if you think about it, it's not that I lose health insurance and I immediately feel sick, right? That's not how that mechanism works. So you wanna start thinking about what are the actual mechanisms and those are the things we actually wanna test. Um, for example, recently uh, a student came to me and asked me um, that he wants to study the effects of uh, recessions on SAT scores. And I was like, okay, interesting topic. Tell me, what is the mechanism of how recessions are gonna affect SAT score? And like by pushing him to create stories of like, okay, this is how I envision it, that's actually really useful because then you can test those mechanisms to see if they work. Um, uh, how does uh, healthcare utilization affect the uh, change of Medicaid? And can we build a case for uh, symmetry? So one interesting thing, and this is coming more from the econ uh, background rather than the policy background, is that a, a question that I get asked a lot is, sorry, why do we care about people losing health insurance? If we already know the effects of people gaining health insurance, isn't it just the same, but like the opposite kind of, like everything with a negative sign? And that's a fantastic question. Um, so there's reasons to believe why that would be the case, but there's also reasons to believe why that wouldn't be the case. Uh, from really uh, good evidence here um, that our social psychologists do, if I give you something, that's a very different treatment than if I take something away. And a lot of different reactions you can get to that. Now that's just from the like purely, from example, psychological point of view. You can think from the policy point of view a different way, right? Imagine a person that has diabetes and obtains health insurance and now is able to access a doctor. So that person is gonna be able to learn about their condition, uh, their diet, what medicines to take, and how to handle their behavior in some sense. Now, if that person loses health insurance, they're certainly losing the access part, but they're not actually losing the information now. No, they still know they're diabetic, they still know how to maintain their diet, they still know some preventative measures. And so it is important to keep those things in mind because those could actually create asymmetries between gaining and losing insurance. And so because we can hypothesize about these ideas, this is why I think it's also an interesting empirical question because theoretically we won't be able to tell like which dominates the symmetry or not the symmetry. And so this is an interesting thing to actually check empirically and see what the data says. Okay, so how I'm gonna study the effect of contracting public health insurance on any of these outcomes. So what I'm gonna use is a reform that occurred in Tennessee in which about 190,000 people we're seeing somebody from Tennessee here. From which area of Tennessee? Memphis. Memphis, great. I lived in Nashville for five years. Um, so one thing, I like this is just a plug. I always like to do research from the place that I live in. So obviously this fit really well. And so don't worry, Virginia, you'll be, we will be treated. Um, so uh, in Tennessee, in about 2005, August of 2005, the state decided to disenroll about 190,000 people from their Medicaid program. I'll explain a little bit of why that came about. And, but this is the reform that I'm kind of using to study how people losing health insurance is affecting their outcomes. Um, one thing that I didn't mention before, uh, I did say that there were a lot of studies that, uh, that look at people gaining insurance, but not a lot of studies people losing health insurance. The reason why that is, is because 
we haven't had a lot of opportunities in which people lose health insurance in what we call an exogenous way, which means like they were forced to lose insurance, right? And a lot of, uh, uh, you can think that there's a lot of people who are like, oh, but if you lose your job or if you decide to move, then you lose health insurance. Those are a lot of things that people are deciding to do. And so that creates a lot of confounding. And then it's going to be a lot harder for me to disentangle. Is it actually them losing this insurance or is the decision, is it correlated with that decision of losing employment and so on? So we really need something of an exogenous shock where people are like, kind of like compelled to lose health insurance. And this is exactly one of the few shocks that we can study for that. Um, so uh, usually I like to go through the literature on like what has been done before on this topic. Uh, I am uh, gonna give a very like two minute overview of what it is. Um, so there are some papers that are related to this that look at the reform of 10 care. Uh, there are some papers that look at public health insurance expansions, a people gaining insurance on you name the outcome and then expansions on financial outcomes, right? And, and, and there's a lot of uh, evidence on that. So I think I'm just gonna talk about the 10 care papers that are out there. Um, there's a paper on employment. Uh, and basically what they find is people lose health insurance and employment goes up, i.e. they're starting to get, go from part-time to full-time. The mechanism there is the idea that I don't get covered by Medicaid and so I need to find another way to obtain some health insurance and I start working more hours. Now you can think that's a good thing in some sense and you can think like, okay, well maybe those people should have been working uh, anyway. And so that's an interesting uh, implication about that and, and we can talk a little bit about that later. Um, I would have to say that there's a caveat to that finding that in, um, in replication studies it's been a little bit harder to find. And so that, that that uh, finding has been more sensitive than we want it to be. Um, there's work with, in healthcare utilization that I'm involved with, in healthcare outcomes, healthcare access. I'm also working on a paper on mental health outcomes, and then that financial outcome papers is, so this two of these papers is the papers you're seeing today. So again, literature is not that big in this thing, um, and I've been trying to uh, push in different fronts for this. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, reforms that people have studied with people gaining insurance. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Just know that they exist. Um, so let me just now talk about the reform. Any questions until then? All right. So this is what happened in Tennessee. So before 1994, a significant portion of Medicaid, which is kind of like traditionally funded and traditionally given as the federal government wants to. Um, and it was mostly funded on a special tax on hospitals uh, and other providers. And so they tax the hospitals or providers, they use a lot of money to fund Medicaid. Uh, that tax was going to expire in '94, and so the government, state government, needed to do something about like, okay, how are we going to fund uh, Medicaid in, in the next following years? Uh, at this point, Governor McWhorter was uh, in seed, and there was the political context here that is important to know is that there was a big push towards national health care reform. Right? Remember, this is '94, Clinton years, so a lot of people are trying to push on that. And so this governor kind of wanted to be like a state lab for that like big push in universal care. So you can think of 10 care 94 as analogous of Massachusetts in 2006. Um, so the three options were given to the table. One, okay, you need to increase your taxes, which is basically like keep taxing the providers and then we get that money and we fund uh, Medicaid. Two, you can reduce provider student reimbursement rates. That means you pay less to doctors and physicians and all of that. Or three, you kind of like rechange how we do a healthcare system here in Tennessee. That's like the third option. So kind of like either you get more money, you pay less, or you change how we do everything. And so the governor decided to go for the last option, which is let's change how we do everything and restructure a healthcare system in Tennessee. And he had two goals in mind. The first goal was cost control. And his idea of cost control, or their idea of cost control was, let's put everyone on a managed care organization. Managed care organization, it's, uh, it was uh, a, a lot of, around this time there's a lot of movement towards an MCO. In a very simple format, what an, the way the MCO works is I'm the state of Tennessee and let's say I have 100 people to cover on Medicaid. Per each person, I'm gonna pay a beneficiary like fee. So like for each person, I'm gonna pay $2,000 and you take care of all the claims and everything with that, this other third party organization. So kind of like Tennessee doesn't have to do much other than like pay uh, per, uh, per enrollee fee. Uh, and so his idea was like, well, if we enroll everyone on an MCO, we're going to spend less per beneficiary and we're going to save some money and we're going to use that money to expand public health insurance eligibility to people that never been eligible before. And that was kind of like the main goal. So we're going to cost reduce and we're going to expand. 
Uh, and they did exactly that. They moved everyone to an MCO and they opened an eligibility for people up to 400% of the FPL. That is very generous uh, compared to other states and very generous, especially for that time. And secondly, uh, it was a categorical change in eligibility to chalice adults. Chalice adults basically have, at this point, barely been eligible for Medicaid. And when I say that, I mean, if you are, you know, 1% over the FPL or 1% under the FPL, how you want to see it, you still, and you're a child's adult, you're still not eligible for Medicaid. So that's important to like internalize that a lot of people think like, well, once you're poor enough, you'll be able to be eligible for Medicaid. And this time in period, that's not the case. In some states, that's still not the case as long as you're a child's adult, right? So you have to keep that in mind. Um, so this was like extremely generous in, in that sense that people up to 400% of FPL who could be child's adult uh, could sign up for that. Let me show you uh, a little graph that can illustrate that. So this is uh, Medicaid income eligibility for child adults as of April of 2015. So before the ACA, all these states were white. Uh, basically for a long time, there's a period in California that and in the 80s that did accept for child adults, but that was briefly. After the ACA, those, uh, uh, the states were blue, now start covering child adults. And then slowly some of the states are adopting uh, some Medicaid expansion so that they can cover child adults. Uh, does Virginia does or does not cover child adults? Anyone want to answer that one? Turner? You know? Right, so we just passed a law that says we're going to cover them, right? Until we'll start to cash a little, yeah. Great. I like to call calls, so I apologize for that. My students know that. Okay. So they did this reform in 1994. A bunch of people signed up. It was pretty successful in the sense that people signed up. Um, for a, a little bit to the year 2000, and they started running into some budget deficits. So overall budget deficits that a state report said they're mainly driven because of the rising cost of Medicaid. So I.e. the story they were trying to tell is something along the lines of like, we're putting a lot of money in Medicaid and it keeps growing and growing. And this is what's driving our budget deficit. So we need to do something about Medicaid. Okay. Um, and so there were a lot of, uh, between 2000 and 2005, there is a lot of initiatives and political context about what to do. And again, the ideas are pretty much very similar. Well, maybe we should tax more people or maybe we should reduce provider reimbursement rates or maybe we should kick people out because we really can cover the expansion as we thought we could. Um, and now a bunch of those ideas. In around 2002, there was also the time of the elections. So as you know, when there's time of elections, people don't do really do anything. They just say they're gonna do things, right? And so um, that's exactly what happened. So the governor, Governor Bretson, ran on a campaign on, I work from the healthcare field, I know what this is, and I know how to fix the system. Um, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you, uh, was it deep? But anyways, so he got elected. Um, and uh, his big, uh, after a lot of like, push back and forth between organizations uh, about what to do with uh, ten care. He decided, he announced in December 2004 that uh, they're going to cut back the expansion eligibility and that they're essentially going to kick people out of Medicaid. And who are they going to kick, the, uh, who's the people are going to be kicked out? The chalice adults. So what they're going to do is saying chalice adults are no longer eligible for Medicaid as they have been before. Um, and now they can have, everyone else kind of like as traditional Medicaid stays the same. And so that was like a big deal. And there was like a big announcement. So people sued the government because of that. Um, August 2005, people started getting the letters in the mail saying you're no longer uh, subscribed to Medicaid. So the estimates of how many people got disenrolled is about 170,000 to 230,000 people. I like to use the more um, mid level of that, which is 190. Um, but however number you want to internalize it. How big this is. Um, well, first, let me tell you that around 90% of those people were chalice adults. So again, this is just reinforcing this idea that that categorical eligibility was wiped out. Um, this is about 4 to 6% of the non-elderly population in Tennessee. Why non elderly Because all the elderly 65 and up have Medicare, right? And so this is not, you know, a huge, like 50% people are losing Medicaid, but this is a big chunk and definitely a big chunk out of the people who have Medicaid. So let me show you uh, what does that look like in the data, okay? So uh, here, what you can see is that before the year 2005, Tennessee only had annual counts of the number of people enrolled in Medicaid, so that's why you would see like a very nice data. After 2005, in particular, more people, they started having a monthly, so 
people have microcosm. And what you should note is that right in August of 2005, boom, you see a big drop in the number of enrollment that lasted in through May 2006. And then it kind of like kept constant with some noise into the data, right? And so that's exactly the reform that I'm going to use in my data. And, and, and the simplest way you want to think about this is that if I see a similar pattern there, if I, if I put like health on the y-axis and I see a similar pattern, I'm probably going to think that that's going to be because of the disenrollment rather than anything else. Um, so one thing that is important to consider, uh, which I think why makes this study a little bit more policy relevant than the others, is that uh, oh, um, Massachusetts Health Reform and the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment are two other uh, reforms that were done in states that people really look into for evidence on uh, what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act. What's interesting about that is that if we look at the demographics of who got affected by the 10 conditions enrollment and compare them across the ACA, the Massachusetts Health Reform, and the Oregon Health Insurance Experiments, really the two that are most similar are Tennessee and the Affordable Care Act. And so if we're thinking of what's going to happen when people lose health insurance for the ACA, I think the best place to look, in my opinion, is the Tennessee disenrollment. And that's this is just trying to make that point. And the second point I think is trying to make is to understand who are these people who are being disenrolled, right? And so the first thing is something I already told you, which is 90% are child adults, you know, 70% of the people are between 35 and above, uh, kind of like a little bit more female than male. Um, a big chunk of them are white. Um, and lower educated, right? And so what's, in, what's useful about that is that when I look at my effects, it better be the case that the effects are for either the lower educated, white, the females is not too much different, um, and like older population, right? And so that's exactly what I'm gonna try to look in my data to see if, if the effects are on that population um, consistent. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna use for data, let me just put all those things here. So I use, uh, uh, the way I obtain my data is I don't go and collect it on my own. I use surveys that have already been collected. So one of them is called the Behavioral Risk and Factor Surveillance System. This is uh, administered by the CDC, but each state has their own version of the of this survey. And this is really the survey that a lot of the states use to track their demographics on diabetes and health um, and uh, cholesterol and all that stuff, all the prevention stuff. Each state uses this data to, to calculate their um, statistics. Then also uh, we have access to the National Health Interview Survey. Um, this is uh, a widely uh, uh, administered survey across the United States that asks a lot of questions about health. Um, I also have administrative data records on, on TenCare, so I can show you like people losing health insurance. Um, and then financial outcomes, I get it from the Equifax data. So if you heard, there is a credit score data that got leaked recently. That was me, not just kidding. I actually got this through a legal way um, uh, through a co-author in the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. So what I have, what we have is about, is a 5% sample of credit scores of individuals and we can follow them over time. So if you have a credit score, uh, you may be in this data, but it, you have to live in Tennessee. Okay. So now I'm supposed to tell you the empirical strategy of like, okay, well, how to use this data and how to use this reform to tell us something about what happens to health outcomes. And here, this is like a bunch of equations that I use, and this is what I use in my econ jargon talk. But I've really quickly drafted some figures, which I think maybe are a little bit more helpful to understand to a broad audience. So this is what we're doing, um, or this is what I'm trying to do when I'm doing um, my, what we call identification. In the perfect world, what I would like to see is person A, before they receive a treatment. Here, treatment, I'm thinking people are forced to lose Medicaid in some sense, people losing health insurance. And I wanted to see that person before the disenrollment and after the disenrollment and see their changes, okay? And in the perfect world, I would also like to see that person before and after without them losing health insurance, right? So again, it's the same person, one going through the treatment and one not going through the treatment. And that is the most perfect world that we can think of. The problem with that, is that we cannot observe one of those universes, right? The universe, or you either observe one or, or observe the other. You cannot observe both. And so that's like, kind of like the main problem in what we call on causal inference. We can't observe the right counterfactual. Um, and so what I do instead of that is, okay, well, I can observe people in Tennessee before the treatment, and I can observe people in Tennessee after the treatment. So those things do exist, so that world exists. But my counterfactual, which is Tennessee before and after had the treatment that happened, I don't have that. So what I'm gonna use is a set of other southern states, like all the, set, all the other states in the south, um, and, and use that as my control group. 
So the things that should be popping into your head as flag is be like, well, wait a minute, like Virginia and Kentucky and all those other places maybe look really different from Tennessee. So how can you say that that's a good control group? That's a great question. Um, so what we do is what we're the, here's where we get into like, well, what are the assumptions of the methods that you're trying to use? And in the simplest way that I can say this, this, the main assumption here is you're right that Tennessee and the other set of states, and let's, let's accumulate them and make them one data point, like one, one kind of like other southern state, uh, can look very different from each other. But what I want to assume is that over time, they're evolving in very similar ways. And the idea is that if you have a line that you see like their outcomes on one way and their, um, sorry, the same outcomes for Tennessee and the other southern states, they might have different levels, right? Because again, you clearly pointed out that they're different, which is true. But if they're trending in the similar way, then that's going to be a good evidence for me that they are on a similar kind of like pathway. And the idea being that once a reform hit, if one diverged from the, from the other, i.e. Tennessee diverged from the southern path, that's to me evidence that this is something that really only happened in Tennessee and not the other southern states. Why? Because they would have just otherwise followed the same trend as they were following before. And that's kind of like the main key of the identification strategy that I'm using. And so what I'm assuming here is that Tennessee would have followed kind of like the same path as he was following, not as the same path as the other center of the states, but it's in parallel kind of like trends that are following the other center of the states. Do you have a question? Yeah, that's a great question. So, right, how do I manipulate my control so that it actually works, right? So I, what I do is I say, I'm gonna use all other Southern states without not picking and choosing exactly because I don't wanna get into like, well, why are you picking and choosing? So I say all the states in the South. Now I could have used all the other states um, in the United States. Um, and I actually do that as well. And there's a lot of exactly the same, but I think this is a much better like comparison group, yeah. 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 And see them the same person afterwards. That's a great question. Yeah, so the reason why uh, we don't follow that strategy is because the, what, what she's trying to say is, okay, you're, uh, you would have to compare, let's say 23 and 25 Sebastian, right, before the reform to 28, 29 Sebastian after the reform. And so the problem is that I would, I would have to argue that these two people are a really similar, and maybe I could argue that, but the second point is that these people have already been treated. And so in some sense to me, they, they're contaminated by the treatment already. That's, that's key, right? So I want to analyze it compared to people that are not going to be treated. Good question. So this is kind of like an um, uh, overall picture of really what I'm doing. Uh, I only want you to think of the two lines on the top as one line and the two lines on the bottom as one line, and I'll tell you that in a second and, and why, why it makes sense also to put it in two lines. So if you look at that, the idea is that before the reform, things are trending in like a similar way and you can test that statistically. It doesn't look like that and that's because it's very noisy. When you take out a lot of the noise in the data, then that's when you see that things are gonna be trending much more um, uh, parallel in some sense. Now, I, I like to show the raw data because I like to be like very transparent in what I'm doing. But here's the key part, right? What you see is that, okay, things are trending in a noisy way, whatever, but after the reform, you see a huge divergence of the line that is not happening in other Southern states. And that's where I pick up my identification. So all the regressions are doing is netting out the noise before, netting out the noise after, and seeing is there a divergence between one group and the other. Okay. Now, why are there four lines here? The reason is because for me, it was quote unquote, not enough to be like, well, I don't think Tennessee is a group, uh, control group for other Southern states. I think there's uh, uh, you know, a lot of things that could be different, especially in the trends. So what I did is, well, I do know that 90% of the individuals drop were childless adults. So what I did is, okay, I'm going to compare childless adults to adults with children in Tennessee, and I'm going to grab the differential in outcomes. And I'm going to compare that differential in outcomes to the differential in outcomes 
in other standard estates of adults with children and adults without children. So here's another differential. This differential is actually evolving pretty similarly. And then once the reform hits, they're gonna diverge. So what I, the two by two kind of version I was telling you about is what I call the difference in difference. What I'm doing here is doing a triple difference. And so I'm adding a layer of robustness that like if I'm true, then it better be the case that I'm still gonna be able to see it in a triple D. So it's just a way to make the um, identification a little bit more robust in some sense. And so that's exactly what it's doing here. You see adults with children, adults without children. And really what I'm, what I'm uh, identifying is the difference between the first two lines and the difference between the second two lines. Um, they're gonna trend similarly. And then after the reform, their side diverges that you can clearly see because the red line is going down. And that's just health insurance rates. Okay, any questions there? So what that kind of like shows you a little bit just to like wrap it all up is that with data that already exists that has not been collected for the purpose of this particular analysis, just data that exists out there in the world, you can use techniques to study policies that have happened in the past um, and, and see what we can learn from there. And I think that's like really important to conceptualize. Um, uh, and, and that's the, uh, the alternative to doing the other way, which is like, well, what if you actually go and implement the policy and evaluate that and just have all of that in a randomized control trial setting? So randomized control trials are very useful in that setting, but you need to have money and approval and people willing to do it. But um, for example, for a study like this, uh, probably would have never happened. Okay, so the way I'm gonna present the results are gonna be first, I need to show you that there is a decrease in health insurance coverage because it could be the case that like, people lose Medicaid and they get other sources of health insurance. And so then that would be, there wouldn't be an effect effect of losing health insurance. Um, and then I'm gonna show you that, um, uh, how are, what are the pathways in which losing health insurance is gonna affect health outcomes? And I check for three pathways. One is the classical healthcare access, i.e. you lose health insurance, you're less likely to go to the doctor, therefore you get sick. Preventative care, which is i.e. you lose health insurance, you're less likely to get preventative care, and therefore you might get sick or health behaviors, which actually goes the counter way, which is what we call moral hazard in economics, um, which is means, i.e., I lose health insurance, and now I start taking more care of myself because I wanna be much more careful now that I lost health insurance. And that's a possible mechanism that we can test in the data. And so finally, then I wanna show you, because I have these two forces that like, there are things that force you to have less health and things that force you to have better, maybe better health, what is the overall effect on health, and how does healthcare utility change changes and then your financial outcomes. So let me go back to this table. And I only really want you to focus for the sake of time on the column on the middle, which is the lower educated sample, right? Which is again, the people who we highly impacted. And so the way to read this table is that what this is saying is that uh, the reform increased people reporting that they lost Medicaid by 3.6 percentage points. Uh, it also tells us that it decreased people reporting having Medicaid by 4.8 percentage points. Uh, increase an insurance rate by 5.2 percentage points. So across the board, what I'm showing you here, and I tested with one survey with another survey, just to be robust, is that I find pretty robust evidence that people are losing health insurance. Um, let me see if I can show you this. Just a, oh, maybe not. Okay, there is another way to internalize in these numbers that I think would be helpful, but I don't think I put it here. Um, anyway, so what? And and the way I'm getting this uh, coefficients here. I run the equation that I kind of like gloss over that is really capturing what I explained and it's explaining what is that like difference, what is that divergence at that point in time. And that's kind of like what that effect is showing. So A, they're losing health insurance. Yes, and that's covering the data. And that, this, is, this is to me like a little bit of like duh because like once you see it in the like picture there, it's like very like to that you're gonna see it in, the, in, in this kind of regressions. Okay, what about healthcare access? Again, I'm gonna focus on the column in the middle. A lot of these are outcomes that tell me if uh, you have decreased your healthcare access. So how often do you report that you forgone delay going to the doctor because of, because of costs, specifically because of costs. You tell me that you cannot afford your prescription drugs, senior doctor, general doctor, and so on. And all of these outcomes are pushing in the direction in that a lot more people are reporting that they cannot go to the doctor, they cannot afford the prescription drug, and senior doctor, general doctor. Um, I wanna talk about uh, I've talked about the direction of like, okay, it's going the way we think it's going, but I want to talk about the size later of like how big or smaller this effects. Um, what about preventative care? You can look across all you want. I see no changes in preventative care. And that was a little bit surprising to me. 
that uh, we don't see any changes in people reporting having less or more preventative care. Um, what about health behaviors? I don't really find uh, a very strong evidence of any health behavior changing with the exception of the flu. I find that as people lose health insurance, they're more likely to get the flu. Um, this I thought initially is a little bit of a spurious result because sometimes you get spurious results. What's interesting about this is that uh, this result has been replicated in the opposite way for Massachusetts, i.e. people gaining health insurance are less likely to get a flu shot. So I think that maybe that is some evidence that there's some what we call moral hazard happening. Um, and then finally, when you look at health outcomes, the way I look at health outcomes is number of days you report incapacitated, number of days you report having bad physical health, bad mental health, and so on. Now, uh, one thing that, again, your brain should active a flag is like, well, this is a little bit like people are self-reporting these things, right? So how much can we trust? You're absolutely right that there could be some measurement error. The thing, the thing that is really interesting is that this would have to be, um, right, people don't know that they're being asked these questions because of less health insurance, right? They're being asking these questions overall. And so like, it's a little bit hard to think that that's gonna influence our results here. But you should still be mindful that these are self-reported. And so um, these are not like, you know, objective measures of health. Um, yeah. Gain. Mm -hmm. They were more like, uh, so you, you gain insurance, you're less likely to get a flu shot. You lose insurance, you're more likely to get a flu shot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's just kind of showing you uh, evidence of health. What about like how they change their healthcare utilization? They uh, report a lot that they're changing the place where they usually get healthcare. Um, they're saying, we are changing it. When, I ask where, when we ask where, it seems like mostly they're shifting away from their regular primary care doctor to the ED. Um, however, the evidence is not very strong here uh, when it comes to ED usage. So uh, I don't have like a sharp result on like people using health insurance and they start using the ED very, uh, uh, like the, I see a lot more people using the ED. I don't see that. What I see is that within the ED, I see a lot more people coming in that are uninsured which is in itself not necessarily a great outcome because being in the emergency room costs a lot of money and that could uh, add to your bills. And so with that thought, um, we also can look at financial outcomes. If you lose health insurance, how does that affect your financial outcomes? Now, the point that I wanna make here is that I think this is actually the pivotal like, outcome to look because health insurance is not designed by any means to improve your health. The same way that car insurance is not designed to improve your car's health, what really insurance should be doing is mitigating you from financial shocks. So even if health insurance does not have any effects on health, if it works as mitigating your financial effects, then that's really good reasoning to have an insurance. So I wanted you guys to keep that in mind that a lot of this literature has focused on like health insurance does it affect health or not? Does Medicaid work if it affects health or not? And the key is like, well, it's really about financial outcomes. The health part may be a bonus about that, right? So I think it's really interesting to check financial outcomes. And um, let me show you this picture, which kind of shows you that coefficient that I keep showing you table, but like in a dynamic way. And what it says here is that before the reform, we didn't see a lot of differential between the treatment and control group, which makes sense because they're parallel trends. But after the reform, we see a huge divergence. And what that says is that people are reducing their credit scores by a factor of about Um, if you're not really familiar with how credit score changes, that is a big, big change. That is almost as big, smaller, but almost as big as like the Great Recession hit. Uh, so when you lose health insurance, for the people who like get really affected, this is actually a big uh, shock in their financial outcomes. We did a bunch of analysis of like who is getting more affected. Unsurprisingly, it's the people who started with lower credit score and a bunch of other falsification tests. For example, we did all this analysis to people who are 65 and above, in theory, they could have lost Medicaid, but they still have Medicare, so they shouldn't be affected by any of this, and that uh, is true, um, and different cuts. So let me um, conclude on kind of like overall what I find and what's the story that I'm building. So I find evidence that this reform led to a 2 to 4% uh, decline in overall health insurance rates. Between 36 to 50% of the individuals who lost health insurance remained insured. The rest had another way of obtaining health insurance. So that's a little bit of how to internalize that magnitude. It's like, okay, uh, this 170,000 or, or 200,000 people lost health insurance and about 50% remain insured and the other ones remained um, uninsured. 
out of the ones losing Medicaid, 70% of them will be less likely to go to a doctor, it's a big number. 40% will have problem accessing drugs. Uh, this in turn has an effect on their health. I'm estimating about two to five days increase in the number of six days being reported per month. Um, once they go for medical care, they try to go for EDs. Again, this is a little bit of footnote, like not a super strong, so I wouldn't be pushing this effect too much. Um, and this effect definitely had an, uh, uh, an effect on people's consumptions and finances by decreasing the credit score, more likely to be bankrupt, and other set of financial outcomes that I haven't shown you. Um, the last point that I want to touch here is this issue of symmetry, right? One of the interesting things of why I look at this reform is because we really haven't looked at people losing health insurance. We kept focusing on people gaining insurance. So what I've done here is create this really like a uh, simple table that compares the results from the Oregon health insurance experiment. This is people gaining Medicaid to the results of the Tennessee disenrollment people losing Medicaid and seeing if we find symmetries or not. And so if we look at the first uh, table, which is clinical outcomes of health, I don't actually have a measure of that, so I cannot compare that. Self-reported health, we see pretty symmetric results. And the symmetry I'm looking for two things, if it's going in the opposite direction, but the second thing is how big the effects are. Uh, so in both cases, we see pretty good evidence for symmetry. Healthcare access, similarly, uh, good evidence for symmetry. Preventative care, they find really big increases in preventive care and I find no change in preventive care. So that's the first sign of not finding really a symmetry there. ED usage, they find in the people, uh, you give people Medicaid, they increase their ED rates by 40%. I'm finding that you give, take people Medicaid away and people increase their ED usage by 7%. So nothing works apparently to get people out of the ED. Well, that's not true. But like the point being is like, we're not finding symmetry here. Um, in patient visits, some symmetry, but the size is a little bit different. Um, Credit score is definitely symmetry, but it seems that it's a harder shock if you take people away from uh, health insurance uh, and similarly with bankruptcy. It's a, it's, a, it's a bigger shock when you take people away health insurance than getting health insurance. And all of this is with a big caveat that like, this is a very simple comparison. We haven't adjusted for the population and then a lot of the stuff could be explained by that. But just like as a broad sense, because we're seeing some things that are so similar, when we see something that is maybe different, then that could be evidence that it's not symmetric. All right, that's all I have for you today. And I'm happy to ask any questions or answer any questions you guys have. And it could be a bit of this or general questions. Yeah. It's gonna be on YouTube, like and subscribe, link in bio. And if you don't ask questions, I'll call, call you. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, I was just going to ask you this separately, um, but okay. I guess I'm kind of interested in how or if your current research is being used in the election in Tennessee, whereas Phil Bredesen is running for senator and using the platform of Tennessee reform as like his big accomplishment. Yeah. Um, and like saying his desire to take what he did with Tennessee reform to the national level. Right. If you had thoughts on that and how maybe if your research is circulating out there um, yeah. in those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I did get some contacts from some press that wanted to, uh, you know, talk to me about this. Um, I said yes, but apparently, and this is what I'm learning, uh, discussions and like what's important changes day by day that by the time we set up the meeting, it wasn't important anymore. <laughs> so uh, yes, I said in an attempt, but I don't think at least I haven't been contacted directly. Now, it's possible that it's been cited in, like, I don't even know. That, that could be a thing, but uh, not that it's in my radar. Um, and, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, Governor Preston is running again, and, uh, and, and his platform is that he's safe tent care. And, and in some sense, it's a really interesting idea because this, this actual reform actually did save money to the state, right? Well, of course, because you're kicking people out of Medicaid, so of course it's going to save you money, right? The, the issue is, like, well, the, you know, the benefits outweigh the costs. That's a little bit unclear, right? I'm only giving you this picture of like the cost that the people had, but in economics, at least, we like to make things of like, well, is this loss really good than the benefit? That exercise really hasn't been done, and it's a little bit murky if, if that's uh, the case. But, um, but yeah, his platform, this is his big change into Tennessee uh, tanker reform. That's what he's running, but I don't think a lot of people know that. It's Democrat, by the way. I remember during the talk, I might have missed it, but you were talking about how uh, changes in Medicaid access could affect financial outcomes. Yeah. And 
I'm not sure what the data you showed or whether you showed data about it. Yeah, so, uh, what, I, so the, what I was trying to say there is that if you lose health insurance, that's going to affect your finances. 